purpose of this space is to create a very safe environment for people to share a moment of their lives. Matatagpuan sa 104 and 138 na may higit sa tatlong daang sasakyan, brand new and pre-owned, ay pwede niyong pagpipilian. Bago pa ka sa bansa, wala ka pang credit score, walang problema. Marami kaming selection from all makes and models and all trade-ins are welcome. Higit pang informasyon sa surimitsubishi.com Located one block north of St. Paul's Hospital, Downtown Denture Center features complete and partial teeth restoration options. With 35 years experience, Anthony Chung offers mobile services and emergency repair consultation 24 hours a day. Downtown Denture Center, just off Nelson at 970 Burrard in the lobby of the Electra Building. Foodie World has 75,000 square feet of imported and domestic products with a large selection dedicated to our Filipino kababayans. With an in-house butcher, variety of seafood, and produce from around the globe. Open every day until midnight. Foodie World, one block east of number three road off Sea Island Way in Richmond. Centrally located in the Richmond Auto Mall since 1984, Richmond Honda features a large selection of Honda certified pre-owned vehicles Inside the showroom, Honda's newest models are displayed for viewing, and the dealership is staffed seven days a week for financial consultation. All the stories that you're going to hear tonight are personal in nature, some of which can encroach on dark topics as addiction, abuse, self-harm and you may get triggered by them and if you do there is a beautiful lounge to the back of xy that you can go down chill out get your composure when you're ready you can come and join us welcome to my story my name's my name is winston young and i'll be your host for tonight that's my favorite part of the the whole show right there so 15 years ago and, and then some uh I was chasing after the almighty dollar because I was brought up, uh, I was brought up with nothing and then I was told that you are nothing unless you have money. So to me, that was, that was how I gauged myself against everybody. So I went out of my way to make as much money as possible so I can flaunt all the toys, all the pretty, the, the pretty car, the pretty watches, the clothes, going out, eating, all that stuff. But I didn't know that that was just going after something that has no end. But it continued. The more, the more I wanted to make more money, the more I hated myself. But I didn't understand what was happening. And then I, then I got introduced to this wonderful substance called alcohol. And I go, wow, by going out, I can now socialize with a whole bunch of people because it's just the normal thing to do. And then I just started numbing myself. And by numbing myself, this hate of myself started to slowly dissipate. But I didn't also understand by doing that, you also numb off the other side. So I had this very limited emotional range. But I didn't care because I was so focused on myself to prove myself that I was somebody in this world and I didn't even know who I was proving it to. So this went on for 10 years. Numbing, numbing, numbing. Then I found out that the alcohol was a gateway to a whole bunch of other things that could possibly embalm me so now that if I die today, I'm going to look great for the next 50 years in a casket because I'm not going to like degrade at it at any point in time. I'm perfectly embalmed. That's the joke I said and lived. And then May 3rd, 2013 happened when I crawled home from an all night bender, looked at myself in the mirror and said, 
if you don't change your lifestyle, you're going to be dead within the next five years. And that was a serious wake-up call because May 3rd, 2013 was a Friday, and the bender was on a Thursday night, which started on a Wednesday night. And to me, that was normal until some part of me cried out saying, you can't do this anymore. You can if you want to die. And the fear of death is a very strong motivator for me. So then I had to choose. Through my journey, I ended up here to tell you this story. Through my journey and meeting people along the way, I have found that through this human experience that we all share, there are other people that live are experiencing very parallel life streams. And with that, I invite Mark DeSanti up to share his experience and see how he got out of his cycle. Cowley and Company, car accident lawyers representing personal injury and disability victims in the Lower Mainland. A former chiropractor, Lee Cowley has more than 20 years experience as an attorney in BC. Locations include Abbotsford and Burnaby, with a head office in Surrey, on 104 Avenue at 138th Street. My name is Spender Benavides from Drive Motors in Quillam, serving the Filipino community for the past four years. Whether you're looking for a minivan, car, truck, SUV, or a crossover, guaranteed financing available. I am here to help. Salamat po. Located one block north of St. Paul's Hospital, Downtown Denture Center features complete and partial teeth restoration options. With 35 years experience, Anthony Chung offers mobile services and emergency repair consultation 24 hours a day. Downtown Denture Center, just off Nelson at 970 Burrard in the lobby of the Electra Building. Booty World has 75,000 square feet of imported and domestic products with a large selection dedicated to our Filipino kababayans. With an in-house butcher, variety of seafood, and produce from around the globe. Open every day until midnight. Booty World, one block east of number three road off Sea Island Way in Richmond. All the stories that you're going to hear tonight are personal in nature some of which can encroach on dark topics as addiction, abuse, self-harm, and you may get triggered by them. And if you do, there is a beautiful lounge to the back of XY that you can go down, chill out, get your composure, and when you're ready, you can come and join us. <clears throat> Thanks, Winston. Um, I want to thank Robin. Uh, for getting us in touch with that inner child. <clears throat> I'd like to say this story is about uh, a drug addict who uh, overcame and conquered, uh, but the story is actually about uh, a small boy. And so for a moment, I'd like you to picture a six-year-old boy in an auditorium sitting in an audience with probably over 500 children, all looking the same because it's a private, uh, private school, light blue shirts, dark pants. And they're watching a man on stage who um, has no arms. And he's speaking about his life and the things that he's overcoming. And that six-year-old boy is watching this man, and he plays the piano. He does amazing art. And he's talking about all the challenges he has in life. And that little boy isn't thinking about conquering the world or uh, overcoming things that challenge him. He's thinking about being on stage. And from that moment on, he knew he wanted to be on stage. Part of the reason of that was because he was extremely moved by what was happening, but he wasn't observing it from that angle. So flash forward a few years, and um, that little boy's me, of course. And my parents uh, get divorced, and uh, I move away from my hometown in, in the States, and we move up to Canada. And uh, I learned about um, overcoming adversity, and that was the major lesson I learned uh, through my parents um, being divorced. And essentially, as I went through all the phases of my life, I learned more and more skills, and I wasn't sure um, why things never felt quite right 
And I think Winston does a great job of explaining how you're sort of oblivious to what's happening in a way. And so as I uh, learn to overcome a new school where I'm uh, the new kid and, and uh, my mom's a single mom and she's doing her best and uh, we're poor, um, I slowly move my way into high school where I decide that I want things to be different. And I do learn to overcome and conquer. And in high school, I was the captain of the football team. I was the captain of the rugby team. I was in band. I was the lead in a drama uh, or three. Uh, I was on student council, on sports council, and I pretty much conquered everything uh, except for the academics, which I hear a rumor is still uh, the case. And, um, and I absolutely smashed it out of the park in high school. And uh, I also try weed and magic mushrooms for the first time. And so that was uh, <clears throat> a really good learning experience for me because I learned that I was capable. But of all the adventures I had, the number one thing that actually stuck with me in high school was a very odd thing looking back on it. And that young boy heard a, a teacher tell him something that teacher overheard in the teacher's lounge from another teacher. And that teacher said about me that I think I'm such great stuff, but I actually don't realize how great I am and can be. And I don't know why that drama teacher told me, or perhaps I do. Um, but that really stuck with me. So um, unhappy at home and trying to get away, I, I run off to college because that's what everybody was supposed to do. I was mostly doing it to get out of the house. And uh, I had this wonderful guidance counselor who told me I could sell absolutely anything to anyone. And uh, it had my name in it, so I enrolled in marketing. And uh, figured, you know, hey, what the heck, my friends were going to this university, it'll be great, it'll be a good time. And boy, did I learn how to network. So uh, I was really good at networking. I failed out of school twice. I learned resilience, and I went back. And I, I also learned a little bit about pride, whether it's the dark side or the light side. And uh, I went back for one semester after failing out twice, and I, I got good grades, I mean, above 80s. And then I dropped out. And that whole academic thing uh, stuck with me. I even got into uh, student hall council and was voted in, but I couldn't actually do my uh, service there because I failed out of school. So that was uh, learning about humbling. And uh, in uh, university, I, uh, I tried uh, ecstasy and LSD. And I also learned how to do something called raving. Everybody here know what raving is? Uh, essentially, I learned how to dance all weekend long without stopping or eating and then uh, calling into work sick on Monday and maybe Tuesday. Um, and uh, that was a lot of fun, to be honest, and I would never ever glorify that lifestyle. But uh, like Winston says, it, it numbs you. It stops you from really thinking about what's going on. Uh, I'd failed out of university, even though I didn't want to, want to be there. That was uh, hurtful to me. It felt like a failure, but also I felt lost. And uh, being lost goes really well. Um, if you're taking the wrong track, it uh, goes really well with partying and, and doing drugs. Um, so after university, I stayed in the same town. And uh, flash forward four years, um, there's about four years of darkness there and uh, being really lost. And uh, during that time, I added ketamine and cocaine to that list um, and uh, partied even harder and uh, had an array of jobs, got jobs uh, doing labor work and doing some uh, service stuff. And uh, I was extremely uh, well-functioning uh, drug addict, essentially. And uh, then I met this woman who, uh, I met this woman while partying and we started dating. And uh, looking back, she had quite a bit of faith on me, in me. And uh, she suggested that I got involved in the call center world. She said, you're great at speaking. Uh, it's kind of like the new mail room. You can go in there and prove yourself. And, um, and, uh, and that's, so that's what I did. I applied to a call center and got a job there. And I, I talk about this specific point because getting that job gave me something to hold on to. I'd also found this book, and I literally found it in a park. It was called You Already Know What to Do. And uh, it's a book on building your intuition. And uh, intuition's a funny thing. Um, it comes from our gut. So I think I've got a lot of it. Uh, I'm very in touch when I want to be, um, when I'm not uh, disconnecting myself. 
and um, the workbook was very interesting. It it uh, it took you through these these interesting little things to do. So it told you to start thinking about quarters, and you're like you know like coins, and it said look for quarters everywhere. Okay, just start thinking about quarters, and all of a sudden you start noticing you're finding quarters everywhere, and I walk into the office one day to sit in my little cubicle, and someone's lined quarters all the way along my desk. And uh, I'd put the book down. I was like, oh, this is hokey. I, I'm not going to get into it. Uh, you know, the next exercise was like find magazines and cut stuff out. I'm like, oh my god, that's work. I got partying to do. Um, so I saw these quarters, and I'm just like, holy mackerel. So because of the scene I was in, I was hanging around with a lot of music people. I knew a lot of DJs. I was really hip and cool. I was dressing super cool. And uh, I was always complaining about how hip hop artists can make up words and people just start using them. So I started this campaign and I went home. I told my buddy, I'm going to come up with a word and tomorrow I'm going to have it and everybody's going to start using it. And uh, the word was Stigs, S-T-I-G-S. Uh, years later, uh, a United Kingdom television show created a character called Stigs. TM, mine first. Um, so when I was on the phone, I got really good at taking phone calls. It turns out uh, that when you are on speed and you've got a big heart, you're really good at customer service. So I got super good at taking phone calls. And um, while I was on the phone, I would doodle these, uh, these stigs, S-T-I-G, in, in like kind of a graffiti style. You know, I was being cool and I was passing my time. And one of them I really liked, so I put it up on my cubicle. And I was so good at taking phone calls uh, that the director of the company asked to sit with me so that she could see how I was so good and maybe we could help everybody else. I was like, I had only been there for two months and I was like the top of the list. And uh, so she sat with me and for one and a half of the most awkward hours of my whole life, uh, I didn't get a single phone call. <laughs> so she just started by asking me what I do. I told her about the process. Then it starts getting a little weird. And she's like, what would you nor normally do when you don't get phone calls? And I said, well, that's, this has never happened, actually. Uh, she goes, oh, that's, that's cool. What's, what's that on the wall there? And I just turned to her, and I went, oh my god, how do I explain this? And I went, strength, truth, integrity, growth, stability. It just popped right out of me. Good old intuition. And uh, all of a sudden, I had a value system. So I'm a drug addict. I'm also selling drugs on the side. Uh, I've learned how to have pride. I've learned how to work hard and then give up. Uh, and um, I learned to overcome diversity. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now I have a value system all of a sudden. I didn't really realize it. I got about a group of about 25, 30 people using the word Stigs for about a year and a half. You know, it's sort of like the F word, but it's positive. So you come in a room, and it's like, hey, Stigly, hey, what's up? Oh, I'm Stigging. Oh, that was Stigging good. And people get very creative about it. Um, but it really stuck. And it, it embodied something that I wanted to be. And that I, because it had this power that was created within me that I was never attached to before. So there was another four years of uh, darkness. And there's, there was three, um, oh, at the end of that, the director goes, when I said the word, she goes, oh, wow, you already know what to do. And I just went, what? She goes, well, it sounds like you, you know, values are a good thing to have. You already know what to do. I went, oh, man. So I went back to the book. Now I'm cutting out magazines going, oh, my god, i got to get to the next work side, exercise. i I got to get to the next uh, intuition thing. Uh, it's really working out. And um, things spiraled quite a bit. Um, I, uh, I had some family stuff go on. My mother got very sick. Um, in that dark time, I also tried methamphetamine, which is something I promised I would never do, uh, which is speed, uh, meth. It's the thing that uh, right now the fentanyl um, uh, crisis we're having here, that was the kind of originator of the fentanyl crisis. That's what they were mixing it into, that drug. And, um, and although I would say I was a functioning drug addict, it's very hard to keep yourself uh, in place. And what I had to do was, in the workplace, I would have anxiety. I would, I would, what if somebody finds out? Or what if I did too much last night? Or I did too much before work? Things got so bad, I had a plate next to my bed, ready with a line, so that I could get up and live life. And so I'd go to work. Anyone ever seen a movie with a meth addict? Or maybe you know one, you don't have to say so. 
you, they're all really like, hey, oh man, okay, everything's oh wow. So I created this little system, and it was just chill, keep it real, coming back with fury. Not angry fury, but kind of like a power. And it worked when I could do it, but you can just imagine a meth addict trying to go, okay, what was it again? Uh, just chill, okay, all right, just, just chill, okay, cool. And keep it real was about being honest with yourself, because you lie to yourself a lot as a drug addict, and not lying to others. And you don't always mean to lie to other people, but when you're lying to yourself, it's damn easy. And so I tried so hard to do this. It was like, oh, I told my buddies, and he was like, that's a good system. You should keep up with that, man. You're looking pretty, woo. And I was really blessed with some friends who didn't mind telling me how bad things were getting. I was a womanizer. I was not holding up my responsibilities. And I just wasn't able to keep up with it. I changed that system to something called Just Remember. And essentially what it is, is in a moment when I'm able to be, know that I'm triggered, I open up my hands like this to accept the gift or the message. And I just say, just remember, which clears my mind of whatever I'm worrying about. And then the message comes. And it might be like, you need to eat, man. Or you need to have a glass of water. And um, I use that system moving on from the moment I left that job. I started another job getting paid on the table at a hot dog stand. We called it the existential hot dog stand. I started reading books like The Celestine Prophecy, uh, Zen and the uh, Art of Mill Recycle Maintenance, and um, really started to grow in. But my boss would come to let me off work, and there'd be 10 people around. He'd be like, oh, such good business. And then he goes, why does no one have hot dogs in their hand? I go, oh, we're just chatting. <laughs> That's not what I pay you for. So I moved west, uh, and I'm going to flash forward a bit. Because um, there was quite a few dark years there, and uh, I actually can't really remember them, and I'm not sure what state they happened in. But um, right before I moved out, it's five in the morning, I'm sitting with a friend, and she's talking about energy, and she's talking about how scientists are stupid, and all I can think about is how scientists' energy and hippies' energy is the same stuff, because we're all the same. And the dirty window behind her with the light coming in had an angel, and that angel just said, you need to help them understand we're all the same. You already know what to do. And within a week, I was in a car moving west, getting rid of what was going on. I came out west and uh, got a job immediately. And uh, actually just started working on me. I started changing the way I did things. I wasn't able to get off drugs right away. Um, I still challenged with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But being here out west separated me from what I was doing. And it took me a little while to actually decide what I was getting to. In 2014, my boss, uh, I'd make it up to middle management because I kept working at it. Got rid of all the bad habits. I got, I got a new addiction, it's food, and I'm working on that too. And my boss let me go traveling for a year. And uh, I lived out the last of those days. And uh, I also lived the new days of who I want to be. And did some NGO work and some volunteering. And in 2015, I met a woman. And uh, she made me a father by bringing a stepchild into my life. And everybody always told me I'd be a great dad. And I always wanted to be a dad, but no one told me that you had to grow up. You had to look at yourself and you had to grow. And I barely wanted to do that as an adult. And then, uh, then we had a baby together. And about a week after the baby was born, I'm holding the baby in my hands, my new son, so tiny. And I'm thinking about my values, my ability to overcome diversity, and all the other things I built up to that moment. And I realized as I felt something I'd never felt before looking at my child, that I had this sense of love that I'd never known, and I couldn't control it. Someone could take it away at any moment. I had to let go of it. And all of a sudden, I realized I'd never felt that for myself. And that's what I was missing, was the ability to love fully myself. That started a whole new journey of growth, which I'm on right now, and maybe I'll come back some other time and talk about it. Thank you. Mark DeSanti, everyone. Something miraculous happened. I didn't understand. By When you stop numbing yourself, you allow your body to heal. And then you start, your emotion, no, I didn't know, my emotional range started to expand. And then as weird as it sounds, I'll have like really crappy days and I'll be like, this is amazing. I've never felt this bad ever. 
By 25, she had four beautiful babies and a violence-filled marriage. Susie knew that if she stayed in that marriage, she would die. So despite having any self-esteem and any self-worth, Susie found the courage to leave with her children. She rebuilt her life for her children and herself. She went to back to school. She obtained a master's degree. She built a career, a career she had always wanted. She found her dream job, and she was excited because she was serving the public. But it was as stated earlier, the universe knocks. And if you don't listen, it knocks and it knocks. And that's what it did for Susie. Until one day, So now that you've got to experience this space that I'm creating, and if you got a glimmer of light or a bit of courage that you yourself would like to take this stage, you can apply to speak at www.mystorymondays.com. And there's a little link that says, apply to speak. Send it in, and we'll get you on stage. I'm Fender Benavidez, sales and finance for Drivable Motors in Kupolo. We have over 1,200 vehicles in our dealer group. Guaranteed financing available. No credit, bad credit, or new to the country. I am here to help. Salamat po.